Well, good morning, Dr. Fulman. Good morning, Dr. Edwards. How are you? <laughs> this is great. We're gonna Phil have, is right. We're first just time have around, some we had, fun. I think, a, uh, I think we had 11 people at our first President's Club meeting, and uh, it's, we've come a long way, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to jump right into some asking questions and getting wonderful answers, and and then we're going to open it up to you all, and you're going to flood us with questions as well. Um, in leading the way, this wonderful book here, and yes, there will be a book signing a little bit. You know, all authors, you know, are irrepressible about selling their books. So there will be a book signing for this, I think, at 5.30 or something like that this afternoon. And Ed and I will both be there and be happy to sign it for you as many times as you want. <laughs> well, not every page. <laughs> <laughs> so in leading the way, I reveal that you almost didn't become heritage president. It's true. Because of an offer from the British philanthropist Anthony Fisher. What's all that about and why did you decide to go with Heritage? Anthony Fisher founded an organization called the Institute for Economic Affairs in London. And some six years before Heritage was even established, I was a graduate fellow at the London School of Economics and had the opportunity to get to know what IEA, the Institute of Economic Affairs, was about and to work with its founders, Ralph Harris, Arthur Selden, and the others. And I saw Think Tank in action and I saw how it could work. And later on, fast forward, I was in Washington. Anthony Fisher came through Washington, looked me up, and said, hey, I want to start mini IEAs around the world. We've got one that we think is going to be starting in Sydney, Australia. Greg Lindsay, still a good friend, started uh, his center out there. He said, we want to do one both in New York and in Washington, kind of uh, two offices, two bases, because both should really be covered, New York, media, Washington, politics. And we talked about it very seriously. And it started developing. Meantime, I was an outside director at Heritage, and we had a meeting in, as I recall, Lee, it was about December 76, mm -hmm. November, December 76. And Frank Walton, who was then the president of Heritage, reminded the board that he had made a two-year commitment to come in as president of Heritage and that he wanted to go back to Coronado, California. Can't blame oh, him for that. Well, not then. Uh, I don't know, too many people want to move into California these days. But uh, back then, Coronado was, uh, uh, it was a really great spot, and this was immediately post-Reagan. Uh, California's economy was booming, and it was, it was wonderful. Frank was going to leave, and he said, what, Fulner, why would you want to start a new one when you've been involved with Heritage since the first day? Why don't you just take over Heritage from Frank and instead of moving your family to New York and all the rest that's involved. So that's kind of how, how it evolved. I think Linda was happy that we didn't have to move, although she is a New Yorker uh, natively, and she'll give me hell for uh, telling this inside story right well, now. Well, I think she's everybody out there. here today is happy you made that decision and, and stay here in we are. Washington, D.C. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. The funny thing was, Lee, and you recount this in the book, I know, uh, Anthony Fisher's attorney was a very prominent New York attorney, 46th floor of the old Pan Am building, and his name was William J. Casey, uh, as in Ronald Reagan's head of the CIA. Uh, and I'd actually gone up, met Casey with Anthony Fisher, and we were pretty close to signing on the dotted line. Come. Uh, Five years later, six years later, I'm president of Heritage. Joe Coors, our founder, and I go out, call on Bill Casey in his super secret office at the CIA and ask Bill Casey if he'd make a major gift to Heritage for our 10th anniversary. And Bill Casey looked very sternly at Joe Coors across the desk and said, 
already gave Heritage the biggest gift I'm ever going to give him. I let Ed Fulner out of a deal with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, kind of an interesting little sidelight there. So, it's, it's the spring of 1977, and mm -hmm. you're taking over as president of the United, uh, of, well, not of the United <laughs> States. Uh, well, you know, at that no, time, that probably was... in 77, that would have been a terrific idea. You yeah. know, not Considering later. Jimmy Carter. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, why? I mean, what was there about Harris? Of course, you had been working with it from the very beginning, as you say, mm -hmm. as an outside director, but it was basically not that well known. It was a little bit on the periphery of events of what was going on in Washington, D.C. Why? Why did you do that? What was there about I, it? I came directly from the staff of the House of Representatives, and Paul Weyrich, who came, who was the first president of Heritage, who had been a Senate staffer, we both thought we knew what was missing in the Washington mix. And that is short, timely, credible arguments from the conservative perspective that could get directly to the policymaker. Everybody had plenty of books on their shelves that talked about, oh, free enterprise and how great it is and why the communists are bad and the rest of it. But when it came to how could you vote or how should you vote on a particular piece of legislation, that wasn't there. And the late Bill Raspberry, a very liberal columnist for the Washington Post, once told me over lunch, he said, the neat thing about these heritage backgrounders is they're short. I know I can rely on the facts up front. You get to the last page, it says conclusion. I rip that off and throw that away. Well, <laughs> except uh, Bill Raspberry, every once in a while, forgot to rip the last page off. So he became very enthusiastic about some of our early policies, like school choice and things like that. But we knew what the niche was in Washington, Lee. The question was, you've got a kind of a, a, a space here, and the whole space seems to be occupied, so how do you get a new institution mm -hmm. and drive it in right. to that space? Yeah, and that, that seemed, I wouldn't say impossible, but very, very difficult. I mean, there were think tanks around. Uh, you had a comparatively modest budget. Uh, what was the reaction? What happened? in terms of people, would they really begin using the backgrounders and calling upon them and using them? Uh, at first, not much happened, to be very frank. Um, and that's true not only in the earliest days of heritage, but also in the first post fulner Truluck days of heritage. Uh, it took time to build up relationships with individual members of both the House and Senate. One of the things that we talked about and that Jim DeMint has been talking about with our internal staff is the credibility of the research has to be absolute. There can't be bad numbers or numbers can't be adjusted or fixed or something like that because the minute you do that, you know your intellectual adversaries will catch you out and you know then that your friends will never be able to rely on you again. So we knew that was the very first base that had to be covered. Then we had to start picking our, our issues carefully. And some of those early issues, I'll never forget there was one, there was going to be an expansion of Medicare. It was proposed by Senator Ted Kennedy. Well, that should be reason enough to, to have opposed it. But we looked at the numbers and we said, hey, this isn't the $2 billion increase that they're saying it's going to be. It's really going to be much closer to $10 billion. Oh, well, Kennedy, who had fairly good friends in the Congressional Budget Office, said, well, we'll get rid of these young whippersnappers. We're going to send it over the Congressional Budget Office, well, they did. The Congressional Budget Office came back and said the number was in fact a little more than 10 billion. Yeah. They justified our number, discredited Kennedy's number, and that mm. kind of said to people, well, maybe we can rely on these. And then of course, mandate for leadership really came did. along. Phil right. already told right. that story right. and you right. tell it so well in the first paragraph. I know, but what, what really just strikes me in, in writing about this mandate for leadership was really a big gamble, again, fairly small, modest organization, a budget, and so forth, and you made a commitment to doing the mandate for leadership before Reagan was nominated, yeah. let alone elected. Yeah. That makes you, in my book, a pretty big risk taker. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, a couple of things happened there along the line. First of all, we had a great board of trustees. We had guys like William Simon, 
who had been Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Secretary of Energy and Energy Czar before that, and uh, 